Um, first, I did remember to start the screencast. Um, second, midterm remarks. So I wrote a program that graded the midterm, and um, I had it send out grades from many of you, but I was looking at it, and some of them looked suspicious to me, and so I didn't send those out. And even some that did get sent out looked a little suspicious to me. So the ones that are 100% don't look suspicious. They'll stay 100%. But a couple of you who haven't got a grade back yet on the midterm, um, it's because I want to manually look over everything because your grade looked less than 100% and hence suspicious. So if you haven't got a grade back yet, um, don't worry. I probably got your midterm. Um, I'm going to look into that on f uh, tomorrow. Let's see. <clears throat> okay. Go over the last. Okay, so there's a new homework assignment. It's the last homework assignment that you'll get in this class, and it is very straightforward, I hope. Um, it's really straightforward, unlike previous ones I've claimed to be straightforward. This one is genuinely straightforward. So what you'll give me next Friday is some sort of rough draft of your final project. Um, and as it says here in the homework, you make a reasonable attempt to give me something that doesn't look like you just did it in five minutes, then you're going to get a perfect grade on this homework assignment. The main point of this is for me to give you feedback about your final project. Also, if you're worried about like how much you're supposed to do, um, you know, in your rough draft you might say, and I plan to do the following amount total when I actually turn in the final project. And I can give you feedback on that as well. So that's your homework that's due in one week. Um, it's just a rough draft of your final project. Any questions about that? OK. Um, the second thing is that the final presentations are going to be during the last week of class, which is March 5th, 7th, and 9th, because um, there are a lot of students. There are, I guess, about 45 people in the class although there seem to be like half that many right now. Um, but register for the class, there are about 45 people. And uh, therefore, we'll probably need all three days for presentations. Um, we'll definitely have March 5th. In case when I put together the schedule, we need less time, which would be really weird. But if that were the case, then um, I would do presentations on March 5th and 7th, probably, and then have some sort of final lecture on the 9th. Um, but there'll definitely be presentations on March 5th, mainly because there are several students in the class that will be gone on the 7th and 9th for, acad for um, athletic events. So they have these excused absences, but they'll also be giving presentations. So um, the information I'm going to have to figure out about you is um, who has date constraints. So if there's uh, some of these days, such as March 9th, when you can't possibly give your final presentation, uh, I'll want to know about that. And I also need to know what the actual groups are. So um, some people will be giving presentations by themselves. Other people may be combining um, in a group. And I'm going to have to get that information. So the most important thing for you right now, I'm not going to give you a sign-up sheet or anything right now, but the key thing for you to figure out in, in the next uh, day or two is, are you, is your final project with somebody else? And if so, who? Um, what is your group? And if not, um, that's also important. So think about. Um, both of these questions, who has date constraints and what sort of group your final project is in, is part of. Uh, I'm curious, who here is doing a final project where they think they'll probably be grouped with somebody else? They'll decide to work with somebody else. Okay, and just as a check, who is going to do theirs all by themselves, probably. Okay, so it's like half of the people that are here. Um, okay, and before I go on, any questions about anything related to the <coughs> class? Yes? Yeah, did the scratch directory got removed or something? I tried to log in. Uh, um, so right off, so the disk that the scratch directory is on, I suspect that it got somewhat unplugged by somebody in the server room. So after this class, I'm going to walk over there and look. Um, either that or it got... Um, Corrupted. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it can be mounted read only. So maybe I should do that. But it, right now I can do that. I mean, it's. Nope. Uh, dash 
t x three. All right, it's basically I think it's um, yeah, it's not there. As you can see, it's giving an error, but I think that it got unplugged or something. Um, people bump stuff. It's really annoying having your own computers that aren't in the cloud. If they're up in the clouds, so I wouldn't have to worry about that. But they aren't. They're in the math building. Um, okay, so yeah, I'm planning to look at that in a minute. Um, let's see. Hopefully the disk was not destroyed. That would be bad. It is possible, but I hope it isn't the case. Um, what? Yes. Sorry. Um, so by that I mean the following: there are many companies such as Amazon.com that famously uh, rent out virtual machines that you um, don't have to maintain yourself. So if you want to have a fast, powerful computer, you have kind of two options. One option is you buy a fast, powerful computer and put it somewhere and plug it into the wall. Make sure it has air conditioning. Um, get annoyed when somebody bumps it. Get really nice somebody pours coffee on it, etc. The other option is you go to say Amazon EC2, it's a website, and you give them your credit card number, and what they'll do is give you a virtual machine. Uh, it looks like a normal machine. You can SSH into it, and um, the amount of RAM it has, the number of processors, etc., is all controlled by you know little little um, things in a graphical user interface that you control. And if you decide, hey, I'd like more RAM, then they just charge you more money. So they'll charge you several thousand dollars a year for one of these machines, um, for a pretty, for a fairly high-end one. On the other hand, buying a high-end computer and hosting it costs several thousand dollars a year. Amazon does have a free machine, but um, it has only like 600 megabytes of memory, but you can use it for testing purposes. It only takes like a week to build Sage on it <laughs> because of swapping. Um, yeah. It, like it's doing it all and it's swapping like crazy. It'll actually finish, but it swaps it crazy. Um, so that's what I mean by in the cloud. This um, thing where uh, virtual machines get rented out to people and you don't have to worry about any of the actual hosting. It's called cloud computing. It's pretty trendy, I guess. Uh, it's also what people used to do like in the 80s and the 90s too, so it's kind of silly. But, um, but it is kind of nice because Basically what happens is companies like Google and Amazon um, amass a large amount of computing resources and they get really good at maintaining those resources and they often have more computing resources than they need to run their own business. So you only need so much computing resources to run you know, the Amazon.com website. And if you have more and you've sort of developed the technology and have the engineers to maintain more, then you just buy even more and then start selling that extra computing resources to people. Um, for example, just an example of, um, let's say you're, you have a clever idea like Dropbox, and you're like, I'd like to you know, code something up that lets people synchronize their folders with some folder in the, somewhere out there, namely Dropbox. Um, then you might think, okay, now I have to buy a bunch of computers to run this service, and I have to write the software. But actually, you don't have to buy a bunch of computers. You can just write the software and give your credit card number to Amazon.com. And then all the actual work will take place on their computers, and you just pay them and people basically you don't have to worry about maintaining your own data center and so on. Um, in fact, that's how Dropbox is implemented. Dropbox is not um, you know, some big warehouse somewhere. It, well, I mean, it's in a warehouse somewhere or several warehouses, but they're owned by Amazon rather than by the Dropbox people. And one cool thing with cloud computing is um, the actual locations are, there are multiple locations for these computing resources. If you go through Amazon, there's you know, more than one physical location. Um, so if you want to, that might be important if you're trying to serve people all over the world, that um, your services can be hosted easily on the East Coast and in Europe and you know, Asia all at once without you having to actually buy a building or rent a building in those foreign countries. So that's what I meant. So sometimes I'm annoyed I have to deal with a bunch of computers in my own building, um, and maybe I shouldn't always do that. On the other hand, um, each of the computers I have in the math building, which I use for hosting the Sage servers, they're more powerful than any of the machines you can rent from Amazon. So if you want to rent one single machine from Amazon, I think they cap the memory at 36 gigabytes, whereas my computers have 128 gigabytes of RAM. And I bought them in 2008, so, um, so they have some serious caps. But other companies maybe have less caps, like uh, Alex, you have a friend of some company, I don't know how they cap their 
memory size, but it might be bigger, or maybe they're they're yeah. flexible. I think it's more maybe. Yeah. Just use what you want. Hey, I like that. Yeah. <laughs> I want it all. Give me a terabyte. <laughs> Pretty scalable. Yeah. I think the only constraint there is bandwidth. Yeah, because they're in Seattle, right. so you're not going to have super fast bandwidth to China, maybe. Okay, so let's. Uh, any other questions before I get going? Okay, so um, this is part two of the um, number theory thing. So John Bobber or Bober talked last uh, day before yesterday about um, prime numbers. I'm going to talk more about prime numbers today. Basically, my goal today is to tell you what the Riemann hypothesis is in more detail than I think John was able to. I think he just barely touched on it last time. So I'm going to describe it in um, more precise detail. There won't be, for example, there won't be any epsilons or big O's or anything like that. Yes? Did you get that worksheet from him from Wednesday? I do have it, and I haven't posted it. Um, okay. But I do have it, so I've got it. <laughs> it's in my computer right here. So I looked it over before I made this lecture. But yeah, I'll, I'll post it online so that you guys can look at it. Right, so the goal is um, to tell you about the Riemann hypothesis. And first, I'll just run through kind of the key facts about the Riemann hypothesis. <coughs> so the structure of the lecture is I'm going to run through the key facts. Um, and then I'm going to just give a precise statement of the Riemann hypothesis after I just remind you a little bit um, in a way that I think you'll understand. And then I'll um, talk a little bit about related things. And then I'll give a, another statement of the Riemann hypothesis that's aimed more at graduate students, but is equivalent to the first statement. And, um, and then make a few more remarks aimed more at graduate students. So it'll be kind of a version for not necessarily grad students and graduate students. And then I'll show you various calculations and stages that illustrate the conjecture. And I'll say some things, especially aimed at grad students, about why the conjecture is important. OK, so the first reason you might want to um, learn about this thing called the Riemann hypothesis, which I'll just write it in big letters here in case you don't, <clears throat> can't understand my voice since my throat feels a little messed up. Riemann hypothesis. If I were a crank, I would write proof. <laughs> I'm not. So it doesn't fit on the board. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so the Riemann hypothesis is an unsolved problem in mathematics. And it's not just any unsolved problem, it's probably the most famous and important, and important is a key thing there, um, of all unsolved problems in all of mathematics. Uh, it's not the oldest, there are older unsolved problems that go back at least a thousand or maybe thousands of years. But it is um, it is a problem that a lot of people have worked on, has an enormous number of implications, and it's considered extremely important. Um, it, and you'll see why it's so important, I think, as I show you more. But it's basically a, um, it's a conjecture about how the prime numbers are distributed. And um, integers are made up out of prime numbers. Every integer you can write as a product of prime numbers um, up to sign. And um, if you understand how the prime numbers are distributed, you understand a lot how, about how the integers behave. And integers are, um, not surprisingly, a very basic and important um, object in mathematics, because most everything is made up out of integers in some way. Um, so if the Riemann hypothesis is true, then a lot of other things are true. And in fact, there may be, there could very well be a thousand papers that have been published that have a theorem of the form the following result assumes that the Riemann hypothesis or a natural generalization of it is true. Then you have the following. This is very common, um, especially in um, computational number theory, but also uh, quite a lot in theoretical number theory. Um, if you, when you think about the Riemann hypothesis, you can kind of think of it as the statement in mathematics that implies an enormous number of different things. Um, so if this is true, then these other things are true. Can anybody think of a statement that implies an enormous number of things? Just a really simple statement. It implies an absolutely enormous number of things. If it's true, then other things are true. Actually, can anybody think of a statement that implies everything? <laughs> yes, Ben? 1 equals 0? True. That is a statement. If you assume that 1 equals 0, then a lot of other things are true. Um, 
in the sense that the formally, if one equals zero, then law, that, I mean, once you assume one equals zero, then everything you could possibly want to prove is you can do. Um, so the Riemann hypothesis is amazing because it, it implies an enormous number of things, and yet it's not, it's, there's some hope that it's not actually false. So, um, unlike, for example, the statement one equals zero. Um, so I'm really trying to convince you that the Riemann hypothesis is important. Um, another reason that you might believe it's important is um, the Clay Mathematics Institute has offered, has offered, has offered, um, it's a typo, I don't even know how to spell offered, hopefully that's right, is that right? Okay, good. Has offered a million dollar prize to anybody who finds a proof. So if you find a proof of this conjecture, it's worth a million dollars. Um, I don't think a million dollars is really that much money or a good motivation for doing anything, but it is a good indicator of how important the problem is because um, the Clay Math Institute convened a committee of very bright, very, 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 very scarily bright people, and they decided on seven problems in mathematics representing seven different areas, which they considered to be the most important problems they really wanted to encourage people to work on because they're problems with lots of implications, and work towards those problems has already yielded a lot of um, important results. Um, work on the Riemann hypothesis, as I'll try to emphasize later, uh, especially for the grad students, uh, has really helped mathematics develop enormously, even though there's no proof. So I think of this mainly as a, well, given that there really aren't any other problems except the clay problems that are worth a million dollars, it's a, in pure mathematics at least, um, it says a lot about the importance that the mathematics community puts on these problems, if nothing else. Isn't there a huge price for finding really large prime numbers also? That is not really a problem in pure yeah. mathematics. Um, okay. But there is, in fact, and I will, I'll actually give you an example of such a thing later in this talk. But even then, they kind of aren't on the scale of a million. They're actually a lot smaller. They're not that small. <clears throat> But, I mean, these are genuine, these yeah. problems are conjecture and a solution to be a proof. And there's one of them that's been solved. Does anybody know which one? Yeah? Exactly. So there's a statement called the Poincaré conjecture, a conjecture of Poincaré, um, about three manifolds. And it was proved by Perlman, very famously, who um, was offered the prize and turned it down. <laughs> because he is above, uh, he doesn't do mathematics to win million dollar prizes. He does math because he likes doing math. Um, and I respect that a lot. Okay, um, one surprising thing about the Riemann hypothesis, I think, given, well, if you look at the clay math problems, a lot of them are pretty hard to even understand the statement. Um, the Riemann hypothesis, I'm not claiming it's super easy to understand, but um, I claim that you'll leave the room today and you'll have a very precise sense of at least what the conjecture says, so that, you know, there's no question in your mind, you know what the statement is. I'm not claiming that you understand every equivalent version of it or why it's equivalent, but I'll give you at least one statement that's pretty um, down to earth. For example, if somebody had a counterexample, you could, you know, you would have like a calculation you could do which would explicitly illustrate that counterexample. Um, and it's easy enough to state that there are many people who think they have a proof, even though they don't. Um, it's there's got to be thousands of incorrect proofs of the Riemann hypothesis for some reason. It's the same that used to be with Fermat's last theorem. Yes, and still is with Fermat's last theorem. People still come up with shorter proofs and stuff, but it's less common, I guess. I don't know. If you're a number theorist, if you're a number theory professor, you'll regularly be contacted by such people. If you're Ken Ribbit, it'll happen every few days. Um, he's a professor at Berkeley who is very involved in the proof of Fermat's last theorem. Um, and one other extremely important thing, uh, which I'll come back to a little bit later, but Pierre Deligne proved an analog of the Riemann hypothesis. Um, basically, the Riemann hypothesis is a statement about counting or understanding the distribution of prime numbers, 2, 3, 5, 7, etc. But you can make an analog of the Riemann hypothesis, but all you do is you replace the prime numbers by polynomials, and well, by irreducible polynomials. A prime number is a lot like an irreducible polynomial, so you get an analog of the Riemann hypothesis, but in the context of polynomials over, say, a finite field. And uh, that analog is, in fact, a theorem. It's not a conjecture. And he won the Fields Medal for proving this conjecture. So 
that's one reason why there's a reasonable hope that the Riemann hypothesis is actually true. There is an analog of it that looks very similar that is, in fact, true. Okay, so now, what is the Riemann hypothesis? So first, I'm going to recall something that um, John, I think, talked about quite a bit. Namely, there's a function called pi of x, which is the number of primes p that are less than or equal to x. And uh, it's a function. It takes as input, say, a positive real number, and it outputs an integer, the number of primes up to that bound. For example, prime pi of 11 is 5 because, oops, because up to 11 there are 5 primes, 2, 3, 5, 7, and 11, up to and including 11. Um, one thing, though, is that this function is pretty hard to compute, at least when x is large. Um, as one example, Gauss, back in the 1800s, maybe 1700s, okay, a long time ago, in a country, a continent far, far away, Gauss computed pi of 3 times 10 to the 6 by hand. It took him years of tedious making of tables during his spare time. But it kept him sharp. But um, he got the wrong answer. He was actually off by around 100 or so. Um, but that just illustrates how difficult this is to compute. Uh, pi of 3 times 10 to the 6. Pi of 3 million. Um, I don't remember. But you can look at, you can actually find like tables that he scribbled and you can see what number he got. Um, and uh, you can figure out. But I, I don't remember if he's over or under. The point is, it's pretty hard to compute pi of x. If you want to compute pi of 100 right now, I'm sure you could do it. You could figure out what the prime numbers are up to 100, you know, however, and you'd find um, that there's 25 of them. But 100 is a lot smaller than 3 times 10 to the 6. I mean, really, there are clever ways to do this, but um, you basically kind of got to count all the primes, and there's a lot of primes. So if you, well, it's a lot of primes. So it's, compute, it's difficult to compute pi of x. Um, I'm not sure what the current record is, but I think it's something times 10 to the 24. Somebody's computed pi of that number, somewhere around 10 to the 24. Um, I don't think anyone's done 10 to the 25, but it might be that no one will ever compute pi of 10 to the 100. So some big number like that. I mean, it's just the answer is some number that has roughly maybe, I don't know, somewhere around 100 digits, maybe 200 digits. But that actual number, probably no one will ever compute it, ever, just to give you a sense of how hard this is. However, it turns out that there's a function which you can just write down. All you have to do is remember the definition of integral in terms of, say, Riemann sums from a calculus class. And you can write down this function. Um, the motivation for this function comes from some heuristic probabilistic argument. Um, and here's the function. It's just it's a certain special function called y. And y of x is the integral from 2 to x of 1 divided by log of t dt. So I'm just defining a function for you. And just so you can see what the function looks like, here it is. <laughs> By the way, when I plot this function, just to give you a little sage um, background, uh, if you use fill equals true, then it will put gray below the graph of your function. This is very useful if you're trying to illustrate something in calculus. So you can do that. Also, I put text in the figure. I'm just using the text command. And I made the figure squished and wide by using dig size. And I added grid lines by saying grid lines equals true. So um, I'm zoomed in a little too much. Maybe I'll just redraw this and make it a little less wide. So lie of 100, the integral, really the integral is just the area under the curve. So lie of 100 is the area under the curve from 2 all the way up to 100. And just convince yourself that this does look like it might be 29.08, etc. Does it kind of look like 29? Well, this is point 0.2 right here. And it goes out about 100. So everything below this first dotted line is about 20, 0.2 of 100, one fifth of 100. And then there's some more up here. So it's going to be a, a chunk more than 20. So it's reasonable maybe it's around 29. And in fact, it is. OK, so what does lie have to do with pi? Well, the conjecture, the Riemann hypothesis, 
Um, one way to state it is, and I'll make this very precise in a moment, is that pi of x and lie of x are really, well, basically, lie of x is a really good approximation for pi of x. And in order to make a precise conjecture, instead of saying really good, I'll tell you exactly um, how much you need to get the Riemann hypothesis. So here is the statement, which doesn't fit on the slide, which is annoying. So I'll put it in double dollar signs. OK, so there it is. The difference for any x greater than 2.01, the difference of pi of x and lie of x is supposed to be the square root of x times log of x. That is the Riemann hypothesis. That statement is equivalent to every other version of uh, the Riemann hypothesis. In other words, you take the absolute value of the difference of two, these two things, it should be less than or equal to root x log x. Log of x, of course, is very small compared to x, and square root of x is really big. So basically what this is saying in words is that if you compute pi of x, or any value of x at all above 2.01, maybe x with uh, you know, 30 digits or whatever, and you compute y of x and look at the two numbers, they're going to agree for like the half the digits. The first half of the digits match up. Because the size of this number right here is roughly half, half the number of digits of the size of these two numbers. Square root of x has roughly half the number of digits as x. So uh, just to illustrate that with a specific example, um, it takes about eight seconds in stage to compute pi of 10 to the 12th. And you get this number right here, um, which is, I guess, around 37 billion. And now instantly, you can compute y. Um, y is just a special function in SAGE of 10 to the 12th. And look what you get with the two numbers. They're very close. In fact, the first, um, the first six digits line up. They're exactly the same for the first six digits. That's an incredibly good agreement between these two numbers. And in fact, if you take the difference between the two, you get 38,000. So if you compare that to x times log x, 10 to the 12th, sorry, square root of x times log of square root of x, uh, of x um, we get a much bigger number. So it, this formula right there, or right there, um, is easily satisfied in this example. Okay, so question. Is there a tighter bound for the item? Or is that the only one you know? Um, for, well, for specific values of x, I think there is. But um, in the limit, I don't think so. Probably, I don't think it is tighter, actually, in the limit. Um, I do remember once stating it without the log x by accident, and an analytic number theorist jumped all over me. Um, emphasizing strongly that the log x is absolutely necessary. Um, one thing that's kind of surprising, if you draw a plot of each of these, which I'll do right here, um, you'll see it looks like one of them is always below the other one. So, okay, the red one is lie of x. It looks like pi of x is always below lie of x. But actually, um, they'll eventually cross over. Don't really know where, but they will. So it's a, a fact. Um, but here's what they look like. So they look very close. Of course, for the very, for very very small numbers of, or values of x, pi of x is this like really really rough step function. Uh, it basically jumps up every time you find a prime. And lie of x is just a nice smooth analytic function. So it's really good from the point of view of computing it efficiently, um, using it if you're trying to prove something. It just has really really good properties in the limit. Whereas pi of x is a rather terrifying step function. But if you look at it from a distance for a very large range of x, even pi of x starts to look pretty smooth. And these two functions, lie of x and pi of x, kind of look like they're right on top, not right on top of each other, but from an appropriate distance, they'll just look like they're right on top of each other. Um, OK. So again, that's it. That's the Riemann hypothesis. So you can see it. This is a statement that isn't 
extraordinarily difficult to understand. Do you feel like you understand the statement of the Riemann hypothesis? Does anybody feel like they don't? It's just the statement that if you count the number of primes up to x, which I think you understand what that means, and you consider the area under the curve that I plotted, which is the area under the function 1 over log of t. So just for completeness on the board, I'll write the definition of y of x. y of x is the integral from 2 to x of 1 over log of t dt. So it's just the area under the curve from 2 up to x of 1 over log. You can't simplify. There's no like closed form formula in terms of elementary functions for an antiderivative here, but the Riemann sums uh, still give you a nice uh, integral. So you just take pi of x, you take y of x, and we'll be very close. Very close in the sense that roughly half their digits will match up. That's the conjecture. So, some evidence. Uh, <coughs> here's some really old evidence for the Riemann hypothesis. One consequence of the Riemann hypothesis, um, which is kind of silly, but a consequence is that there are infinitely many primes, right? It's not obvious that there are infinitely many prime numbers. But if this hypothesis is true, then there have to be infinitely many primes because clearly this function isn't bounded. Um, 1 over log of t is going to keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger as t gets bigger. So the integral is going to keep getting bigger. Uh, actually, 1 over log t gets smaller, but it never gets it's bounded yeah. away from. That thing is greater zero. than x by log x or something. So yeah. it's greater than h to the sum of power, which is greater than root x. There you are. So, so. Anyways, this, this is unbounded. This function can easily see, be seen via calculus type arguments to be unbounded. Or you can take its derivative and notice that it's always positive, for example. Um, that doesn't, that doesn't quite it. do it. Yeah, so you need because it could be getting smaller. Yeah. Or something like that. Yeah. Uh, but as a double check, its derivative is at least always possible. For you, but it could be getting smaller quickly and that would work. Um, so this is unbounded, and hence pi of x has to be unbounded as well. So you can't stop. There can't be some point where suddenly there are no more primes. Uh, of course, that's been known for a long time. There's a proof, namely you just take the first take. Suppose there are only n primes p sub 1 through p sub n. If you just take those primes and multiply them all together and add 1, you'll get a number. And by basic properties of divisibility, it can't be divisible by any of these primes. Because if it were divisible by any of these primes, then 1 would be divisible by um, that prime, and 1 is not divisible by any primes. So um, it's impossible for this to be divisible by any of the pi's. And hence, there has to be, because every um, number can be written as a product of primes, there has to be a new prime that appears in the factorization of this number. <coughs> so there are infinitely many primes. So in fact, you don't really need the Riemann hypothesis for that. But at least it implies something true. So there's one little true statement here. Um, pi of x is unfounded. That is implied by the Riemann hypothesis and is true. Um, it gives you, comp sometimes you gain a little tiny bit of confidence in a conjecture when it implies something true given that at least you gain no confidence if it implied something false. Um, but uh, false conjectures can also apply true things. Yeah. So that's one thing. Um, another really good uh, bit of evidence in favor of the Riemann hypothesis is that this quotient, pi of x divided by li of x, does converge to 1 in the limit. So, that's, so think about it. That's actually much weaker than the Riemann hypothesis. It doesn't say that half the digits are the same. It just says that if you take the quotient of the two functions, it'll get closer and closer to 1. So what could happen is that, um, say, up to 10 to the 100, the first digit's the same. And then up to 10 to the 500, the second digits are the same. And then up to you know, some really enormous bound, the third digits are the same. That's all you need for the quotient to converge to 1. So it's much, much, much weaker than the Riemann hypothesis, which says that no, for every number, not, it's not even an asymptotic statement. This is a statement for every single x up uh, beyond 2.01. There's no epsilon, no asymptotics, nothing. It's just for every x, you have this. Um, so it would imply this, though. If these two, if li of x and pi of x are that close, then their quotient would certainly, in the limit, converge to 1 because it would be uh, basically one 
for x is above a certain bound, it would be one point and then a bunch of zeros, where the number of zeros would be roughly like um, the half the number of digits. Okay, just to illustrate that, actually, let me do that for a 10 to the 12th example. If you take the quotient of these two, um, it's, well, okay, not one point, I, could, I mean, I can do it the other way. So that it's greater than one in our example, but it's one point and then a bunch of zeros. So that's evidence for the conjecture. It's called the prime number theorem. And this is, as the name suggests, a theorem, unlike Fermat's last theorem, which wasn't a theorem until later on. Um, and that's, again, just evidence. So it's a true statement that the Riemann hypothesis implies. It doesn't, of course, tell you that the Riemann hypothesis is true, but um, it gives good evidence for the conjecture. Um, the way the conjecture has been stated here, though, it's I mean, it's just weird. It's kind of like, I mean, what evidence do you have really for it? It's just when you look computationally with the computer, which is very, very little, since pi of x is so hard to compute, it's really hard to even get data for this conjecture. I mean, you can go up to like 10 to the 24. Think about how many x's there are out there. So here's all the numbers up to 10 to the 24 compared to all numbers. I mean, if you think about it, it's just a sort of infinitesimal interval where we've seen that this looks at all reasonable. Maybe at some point it suddenly gets slightly bigger than this. Um, should be worrisome to you. But there's another formulation of the Riemann hypothesis which um, kind of numerically should feel way more worrisome, which I'll give a little bit later. Um, by the way, and this comes back to what you mentioned earlier, um, there, despite there being infinitely many prime numbers, uh, there are only, well, there is currently a biggest prime number that is known. And here it is. There are no prime numbers bigger than this one that anyone knows explicitly, um, where no means you have an explicit formula for it. So if you take the number 2 to the power of 43,112,609 minus 1, that number is a prime number. And in fact, in Sage, you can compute it almost instantly, because it's a power of 2 minus 1. So it's in binary, which is the internal format that Sage uses, uh, very easy to compute. But you can ask for its string representation, which takes quite a bit longer. This is computing it in decimal now. How and much, what? Go ahead. How much would it take to check it? Uh, you'd have to implement, so there's a special algorithm um, for checking primality of Mersenne primes. And you'd have to implement that algorithm. If you use any of the generic algorithms, for example, um, John Bober talked about is prime and is pseudo prime and so on on Wednesday. And none of those algorithms would have any hope in a reasonable amount of time of verifying primality of this number. Um, there's a project called GIMPS, the Great Internet Mersenne Prime Search. And what it is is it's a, I guess, some sort of program, I think, written in C, that um, people run with spare cycles that tries to verify or disprove primality of numbers of the form 2 to the p minus 1. And this number was found via that program. Many people were running the program, and somebody um, found this number. <coughs> it was really annoying when they found the number, because they said, we have found a number we think is probably the first prime with more than um, 10 million digits. Notice that this has 12 million digits. So the first known prime with more than 10 million digits. There's, of course, smaller primes with more than 10 million digits. And, but they're a little unsure. They had an algorithm that was pretty likely to be correct, but they wanted to double check it somehow. And this was going to take them quite a while. So they made a big announcement that they had found it. And this was right when my elementary number theory book was going to press. And in my book, I discussed this. Um, and I had the, pre the, you know, the, I had one that was below 10 million digits. So in the book, I have to say, somebody claims to have found it, one that's bigger than 10 million digits, but I can't tell you because they won't tell me what the actual number is yet. <laughs> so you'll find that in there, which is annoying. Um, but here it is, and you can look at its digits. So I just computed them. You can say, what are the last 10 digits? It's just a string. You can go, what are the first 10 digits? So that's what the number looks like. Um, and in between that, there are 12 million digits, which is a lot of digits. Um, a very, 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 very large number of digits. Um, so I've seen some of these large Mersenne primes printed out on a poster. 
I don't think this one would fit on a poster. <laughs> really small font. But um, some of their previous records have been printed out in a poster. And strikingly, for this particular example, um, the Electronic Frontier Foundation had offered a $100,000 prize for anyone who could find a prime with more than 10 million digits. And uh, this was the prime that was found, I believe. They, found, they actually found two primes at the same time, roughly, both of which were more than 10 million. I'm not sure which one you know, officially got the award, but it was the same project. Um, so it's crazy that writing down this one number yielded a $100,000 prize. Um, but it did. I think the next prize, I can't remember what size prime you have to get. I vaguely recall maybe it's 100 million digits. It's very, very hard um, to go from 10 to 100. Um, this one was really tantalizing for a while because, uh, I mean, people had found primes with around 9 million digits. And so this one was just so close. And if you just looked at the size of primes people had found as a function of the year, it just looked obvious. Somebody was going to find this 10 million dollar, 10 million digit prime, or more than 10 million digit prime, and win this $100,000 prize soon. And indeed, that's exactly what happened. Um, it was interesting to watch. In fact, I had students in a class I taught, I think in maybe 2008 or 2009, estimate how long until somebody won this prize. And they're like, it'll be a year or two. And uh, of course, they're right. Um, OK, so now next I'm going to talk about a different way of stating the Riemann hypothesis that I think to me makes it feel a little less likely to be true. Um, over here, I don't know what your feeling is when you, when you see the conjecture stated this way, but somehow it feels pretty reasonable. Uh, not this way, sorry. Uh, inequality is the wrong way. It seems pretty reasonable. I mean, and it, I mean, all it's saying is, okay, you have pi of x, you have y of x. Um, there's some heuristic argument for why, which I'm not giving, for why y of x should be a good approximation for pi of x, assuming some randomness about how the primes are distributed. Yes? I'm sorry, and uh, no, these, these, these bounds, these yeah, bound yeah, yeah. yeah. Sorry. It's because I wrote it backwards on the oh, yeah. yeah, go ahead. So this bound is not proven, but are there some from the linear bounds for a line on this pi which are proven? Um, I don't know of any at all, but there could be. I don't know of any. Probably well, I mean, there's stupid bounds. Maybe. Probably some extra Probably like less than, they're both less, less than pi of x time. Maybe. I don't know, I mean, there's probably stupid bounds for the difference of these two that you could deduce from the prime number theorem. Basically, what you have is the prime number theorem, and anything you can deduce from that is a theorem. Um, and that does give you some some bounds on the difference between these two. You know, probably Asymptotically only. A coefficient multiplied by a li of x would be something. Yeah. One thing with the prime number theorem is it's, it's, a, it's in the limit. So this is a bound where there's no limit. Whereas with the prime number theorem, anything you can deduce from that is only for x sufficiently large. You can be constant in that thing to uh, yeah. make up for the first thing. Yeah. I mean, it could be that you know, some weird behavior around 10 to the 10 million. So that could get absorbed in a constant or something. Yeah, okay, well, I mean, if you put a constant in, then yeah. it's a different statement than the European. Oh, do you have a comment then? Seems like you Just that you would mistakenly turn around. Oh, yeah. Okay. Put it on the wrong side of inequality. Okay. But it was technically right. Okay, so um, here's a new formulation. I'm going to assume that you know complex analysis now, which will. Um, be the case for all the grad students, but may or may not be the case for undergrads. Um, but uh, still, OK, so there's something called the Riemann zeta function. It's the same Riemann. And um, here's the definition. You consider the infinite sum, sum n equals 1 to infinity, 1 over n to the s. And here, s is a complex number that has real part that's um, sufficiently large. So say real part of s greater than, I think, uh, one. I think strictly greater than one is enough for this to converge. In fact, for um, S a real number greater than one, calculus students will know that this converges because there's some test that you learn there um, for infinite series. And something you might have seen is that if you put two in here for S, that's the sum of the inverses of the squares, that's equal to pi squared over six. So in fact, this is a function that kind of um, has that 
the fact that zeta of 2 is pi squared over 6 is just a special case of uh, evaluating some more general function. And uh, zeta of 3, uh, Sage just spits back zeta of 3, and uh, that's supposed to be uh, expected to be, I guess it's known to be transcendental. Um, and you can also put in complex numbers. So um, here's a complex number 1 plus i. So this is actually, I guess, not using the sum. Maybe I'll put in 3 plus i, so it's using the sum. And you get back a complex number. So there's a theorem, due to, I think, Riemann himself, which is that you can analytically continue this function to the whole complex plane, except for the point 1, where it has a simple pole. So it's a meromorphic function on the complex plane. So zeta of s is on the right half plane. It's given by sum 1 over n to the s. But it extends to a function on the whole complex plane, except for the point s equal to 1. In other words, there's a meaning that you can ascribe to, in a very natural way, something like zeta of minus 2, which in quotes you might think of as the sum of the squares of the integers. Um, or that you can assign to zeta of, uh, I don't know, 2 times square root of minus 1, 2 times i. So for every number in the whole complex plane except 1, there is a natural meaning for what the zeta function is evaluated at that number. And um, more precisely, can I, assume, I assume you know complex analysis, so I don't really need to say this, but what this means is that there's a power series representation <coughs> over here that, you know, like the little circles agrees with the one over there. So you can patch it all together. And here's a complex plot of what the zeta function looks like. If you want to understand this complex plot type, complex plot question mark into Sage. But it really is uh, genuinely a four-dimensional plot where the brightness and the color together give you the complex number you get at a given point. Okay, so now here's the second formulation of the Riemann hypothesis. If you consider the function zeta of s, which I just defined, then all the zeros of that function that lie in the right half plane real part of s greater than zero have real part equal to one half. In other words, if you draw a plot of the zeta function, as I've done here, and look for the zeros, you'll see that they all lie on a single line, on the line real part of s equals a half. So that's the uh, Riemann hypothesis. It's equivalent to what's over there. Um, some work to prove that they're equivalent, but they are equivalent. And as evidence for the conjecture, it is at least known that a positive proportion of all the zeros lie on that line. And in fact, there's a, an explicit positive proportion. I think it's a third or something. It keeps changing a little bit. Um, so I think, uh, is it Siegel or Selberg? I think it's Selberg, actually. Sorry. Anyway, some number theorists you probably have never heard of prove this, that there's a positive proportion. And Brian Connery um, got an explicit bound that was you know, sort of bigger than what people had got before and so on. Um, other evidence. So this conjecture, somehow you can compute with it a little bit better, give computational evidence that's a little bit better than what you can give for the one over there. So what you can do is you can literally just compute the zeros up to some um, height using a contour integral to count how many zeros there are. And then you just find a bunch of zeros that are actually on the line real part of s equals 1 half. And if the two numbers match up, then you know you found all the zeros. And there are an enormous number of very clever techniques for doing this efficiently that people have, starting with Riemann, um, came up with. Uh, lots and lots of people have worked on this. And I think the current status is roughly the first billion zeros. Every single one of them is known and known to lie on that line. So that's really good evidence for this conjecture. So if somebody were to find a counterexample to this conjecture, an explicit one, they, they might um, find an explicit zero, but it would have to be you know, beyond the first billion zeros that doesn't lie on the line real part of s equals 1 half. The other way one could find a counterexample would be to find, say, an explicit x, for which the difference here is bigger than this bound. And that is the other statement of the Riemann hypothesis. And that was everything I wanted to say. Um, 
I'll leave you with this slide, which shows some reasons that you might care about the Riemann hypothesis, given what I just showed you. And I'll see you on Monday. <coughs> hey. Sure. Let me stop the screen recording. So the homework is due the week after this week? Uh, no, uh, no, I think that was, I do want to keep my screen recording.